Hello, everyone. Welcome to Looking to the East, our twice monthly show, which take a, takes a look at world events and world activities from the Japan perspective, the Asia perspective. And today, fortunately, we're also looking at the topic from a European perspective, as we have Dr. Paul Scott with us on this show <clears throat> from Paris, France. So this is a repeat of a show that we did uh, six or seven months ago looking at the Biden presidency. And specifically at that time, we were looking at the nomination of Rahm Emanuel as ambassador. So we all decided after that show that we would get together again after six or seven months of the presidency and begin to take a look at how Biden is doing from <clears throat> our collective per uh, perspectives. So we have four very distinguished professors and professionals with us. Very briefly, Jiri Maseki is coming from Osaka, and he's a partner at Kitahama Partners, Kansai Gaidai graduate, so that is a link for all of us on the show today. We have S.Y. Kim, who's a professor of international relations, and he specializes on Japan-U.S. diplomacy. So he's joining us also um, from the Kansai Gaidai area, from Osaka. Then we have Johnson Portu, also a professor of political science, uh, living in the, the, the Osaka area as well. And last, as I mentioned before, we have Professor Emeritus of Kansai Gaidai, an icon within the Kansai Gaidai system itself, Professor Paul Scott. He's joining us from Paris, France. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Um, I guess the first thing we can take a look at is a Biden from a domestic perspective, at least as you guys are looking out into the country. He seems to have a uh, focused quite a bit of his attention, his energy on uh, reforming and recovering from the COVID uh, recession slash depression that we've experienced in the last few years or so. Um, <clears throat> I admittedly <clears throat> am a, more of a progressive, so I have email news sources that I read there, and they're delighted with uh, what he has done. I think um, they're uh, collectively surprised at how progressive Biden has been with his legislation and his approach. So why don't I just throw it out to, to you guys, if, if there, you have any comments on whether or not, from your perspective, the domestic agenda that Biden has put forth in the last six to seven months is something that you've seen is a positive for him, uh, a positive for the country, and then I guess maybe a positive for the world, for wherever you're sitting. Jerry, why don't I start with you? I'll call on, on you, like I do in my class. <laughs> <laughs> sure, no problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, thank you very much, Steve. Pleasure to be with you. Um, I, I think that that you know it, it, domestically, probably his his biggest success so far has been been with infrastructure. You know, I, I I think that that is something that he has has pushed, and that will for him long term, assuming they can get it through Congress, is is going to be the most probably lost longest lasting impact of of perhaps his presidency, we'll see. I mean, I think that is something that for those living in the United States, every, everyone sees and, and understands really on both sides of the political spectrum that, that infrastructure uh, rebuilding reform, reform is necessary. So, you know, I, I think that, that, he has, that has been a, a, a very big success. I, you know, what is good and what I also think that has been positive for him is that he's maintained his his moderate base, right, which is sort of the 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 middle uh, between the far left and the far right in the United States, and as as you mentioned, as is winning over progressives, right. Uh, the far right, I don't know that he, you know, the Trumpists and people like that. I don't know that he's ever going to be able to to connect uh, with with uh, with them. But the fact that he's you know got the middle. And is also, uh, uh, you know, winning over progressives, I think, is, is a very positive sign. You know, we'll see. Uh, the, he has had some, some issues, particularly with Afghanistan, uh, that I guess we'll, we'll discuss later. That is more right. of an international matter, but, right. but does affect him domestically as well, I think, at least as far as public perception goes. Any other uh, comments from uh, any of you? I think I, I will also admit uh, one level of bias that I have, and that is that I am radically moderate. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, just the changeover from all the chaos, uh, it's actually quite difficult to isolate uh, success 
this is by Biden without some noise from the previous uh, presidency. So even if you're trying to isolate you know, economic growth, oftentimes economists wait until the second year of a second term uh, to be able to see what is the actual, the actual effect. Uh, so I, it's, it's difficult to say how successful he's been uh, mm -hmm. isolating his, his effect, uh, but just the, the, the toned down chaos I think has had a has had a tremendously influential effect, and not just domestically, but also about how other countries are viewing uh, uh, the U.S. the U.S. right now. Yeah, and I think that's a very good point, John. So I feel that personally too. Under the Blast administration, almost daily, there was some kind of issue or topic that would come up that was just just so difficult to, to understand. I, mean, I began to tune it all out into the third and fourth year, but still. There's a sense of calm right now because we have a, a more stable leader than we had previously. Well, Paul, how, old, how, how, how do things look from Paris? Well, an, an old East Coast liberal would think that there might be some problems with Mr. Biden's credibility and his management skills. Mm. Certain polls are down uh, drastically. I don't know if he had the worst August in presidential history, but it certainly wasn't any good and it's not not getting any better as well. Uh, here in Europe, uh, it is just the opposite of what you are saying, uh, actually, uh, where uh, this, uh, this deal uh, with uh, Australia uh, and uh, the French ambassador was recalled uh, from Washington. I think it might be the first time that has ever happened. And uh, people here are saying uh, that the Americans are not a reliable partner and uh, that uh, Biden is as bad as Trump. Um, mm. That is uh, maybe just the French being anti-Anglo-Saxon. Uh, I read the, the French press uh, right before this, and they were railing against uh, the English and the Americans. Uh, uh, but it was the deal of the century, $66 billion. And uh, uh, again, we're going into international, uh, international relations, but there certainly is uh, in Europe uh, a credibility issue uh, with the Biden administration because he didn't communicate. Uh, he left the French out of the dark, uh, in the dark uh, with this. So uh, that communication issue, uh, I think, uh, is uh, is a is a latent uh, problem uh, with the Biden administration. If I add a bit. Yes, go ahead, that's why, please. Yeah, if we add a bit historical example in terms of the requirements to deal with for, both foreign challenges like rise of China and the withdrawal from Afghanistan, and also domestic problems like COVID and the infrastructure bill, uh, his presence reminds me of earlier presidents like Franklin D. Roosevelt or Harry Truman, both of whom had to struggle with those foreign policy requirements like uh, World War II and Cold War and that domestic need to uh, invest and revive. Uh, as Paul rightly pointed out, for that, uh, it needs greater uh, leadership skill and communication skill to assure uh, allies and the domestic audiences. That skill uh, seems to be uh, not sufficient enough. Although he has been doing pretty positive work in my point of view, as non-American point of view in Asia. Hmm. Yeah, right, Steve, also, if I could just say one of the things yes, that we ahead. should also talk about domestically, one the, 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 maybe one of the biggest things he's done, at least in the past um, a month or so, were the COVID mandates, which is basically he's, he's, he's said that if, if from the federal government, that if you have over 100 employees, uh, you know, you can basically mandate COVID vaccines. So, I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's actually a big deal as well, and we'll hopefully get the oh, U.S. Yeah. economy and businesses back going. Yeah, that, I agree with you, Jerry. That is a major point. I know, uh, Paul, I know France has been doing that for quite a while, uh, yes. issuing mandates on this. So, no, <laughs> but no, in no, the United no. States, it's such a politicized issue because primarily well, because of the previous administration. Well, everything is, you know, public health has become politicized, unfortunately, but everything right. has become politicized. And, you know, America is still extremely politicized. Uh, here in France, there are anti vaccine mandate uh, marches uh, every week. Um, but uh, France's vaccination rate is close to 65% for, uh, 
for mm -hmm. those above 12 years. Uh, for those above 12 years old, uh, the vaccination rate must be uh, in the about 85%. Wow. Um, so um, you don't have to be vaccinated, but then you need a COVID test, uh, which you have to pay for yourself. And you can't get in a restaurant and you can't get in a public space with, without, uh, without the pass. And every place I've gone to, it's on, my, it's on my iPhone, it's on my cell phone. They ask for it because the fine for restaurants is 9,000 euro. Ooh. Yes, or 45 days in jail. So that's really, you know, no, that is the power of the state to say, uh, yeah. get vaccinated and um, France's COVID numbers are, are drastically down. And by the way, I'm teaching in the classroom as of last week. Wow. In yeah, we're not here in uh, Kansai Gaide. We're still online at this point. I'm thrilled. So I guess it, in summary, um, it seems we have a fairly, even though it's early, as Johnson points out, uh, we, we have a fairly positive review of Biden, but with one specific weakness, and that's his lack of communication. Now, I think, you know, if you watched him over the election process as well, I mean, he's not a smooth speaker. No. Uh, he's not all that convincing. I mean, I think he's believable. This is when you watch him, you, you think, it, you know, he's a decent guy, but I would never put him. I hate to say this, guys, but you know, I wouldn't put him in the same persuasive category as our former president because Trump, as, as crazy as he was, he did have a certain way of communicating that was effective for uh, large parts of the society. So I don't, I don't know if he can change that uh, or if, if, if what you're critiquing is him himself in terms of his communication facility or his willingness to speak up. Remember, during the election, there were times when he disappeared and the Republicans were saying he was in the basement. Remember, that was one of the critiques. So that may be a liability of this particular individual that yeah, may be you know, with the, us through the course of the term. Yeah, for the domestic, you know, there's going to be an awful lot of, you know, he has to pass these bills. And, uh, you know, it's going, to be, it's going to be by deficit spending. So there's a deficit issue, which may be the bond markets care about more than the average citizen. Um, and uh, we don't want to... Uh, as a registered Democrat, we don't want to get into this uh, tax and spend uh, um, uh, Democrats uh, um, uh, criticism, but it's an awful lot of money. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of political um, wheeling and dealing this week. Um, Can I mention, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, you didn't. Oh, uh, one thing, I think this, this approach, especially in terms of, of the economic uh, um, or the, the, the COVID spending, basically, that that makes sense from a Keynesian kind of counter-cyclical spending. So in times of bust, you pump money in. In times of, of, of plenty, you take money out. Uh, so even I've been getting uh, COVID relief uh, for my three kids, even though I'm not in the United States. And that actually makes sense because people in my demographic are spending more money than they actually have, right? So that's going to have hopefully eventually it's going to have a, a positive effect uh, on the overall health of the economy. So just from a kind of strict Keynesian approach, it seems like it makes sense. Of course, there are some people on the other side, uh, supply side, that might, uh, might think differently. So I, I think the, the, the answer to all these questions is it's pretty complex. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, move to international. And when I thought about that as I mentioned in the agenda that I sent out to you all. I think the biggest uh, topic there is the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So I think uh, everybody, I'm even on the conservative side of the spectrum, recognized that 20 years was long enough. Um, so Biden, I think, was given credit for finally pulling the trigger, so to speak, uh, on withdrawing from that country. But the withdrawal itself was uh, rough, to say the least. So what, what's your perspective on that? Is, do you think that in the long term, the fact that he's withdrawn from, us, uh, from Afghanistan uh, will be to his larger credit or the fact that it was done in such a chaotic way will uh, be a part of his legacy as well? Hi, well, Paul, I know you have a very strong opinion about well, this. Well, I have what a very strong opinion. I, I worked in Afghanistan twice and uh, uh, I do believe that, uh, that uh, you know, 
I, I, I don't like, uh, I'm sort of nervous when people are saying that we shouldn't do nation building or state building. And I'm thinking, well, it's a, uh, what do, you know, uh, how do we do it correctly? Uh, you know, don't we help, uh, try to help uh, countries become uh, more, more democratic? And ex so, you know, that's, that's a very long, uh, a very long uh, uh, conversation. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I was certainly, uh, um, you know, everyone was uh, uh, disappointed. But what I was going to say is it's the messaging again. This is not gonna be like Saigon, uh, the, um, the, this is Biden speaking, you know, the Afghan National Army, you know, we trained them and, and they can fight and, uh, you know, they have an air force. And I'm sort of, if I had more hair to pull out of my head when Biden was saying this, I would pull it out because um, uh, the Afghan had, Afghans had almost no air force. Uh, they were, uh, planes have to be serviced. That was done by contractors. And it's extremely difficult to do um, air to ground operations. Um, so he was, I don't know what, you know, did he believe this? Um, and then of course we have, we, we have the, almost the helicopter on the roof of the American embassy. So, um, that's a credibility issue that, um, you know, uh, for Mr. Biden, he's, you know, uh, he could have just said, uh, this is going to be rough. Um, and, uh, uh, but, uh, the messaging was terrible. Yeah, and, and even even if he had said it was going to be rough, it shouldn't have been as rough as it actually was. I mean, the I mean those images. I mean, he made Saigon look like a the departure from Saigon looked like a ballet. Uh, I, I I think that that what probably should have been done, and and I think a lot of people, as you said, Steve, on the conservative as well as the liberal side, said, look, it's it's twenty years, time to get out fine um but it was how it's done or well, how it was done that i think is is probably the biggest issue for people and i personally think that this and and, and again not that it was done but how it was done and the images that came out of that are going to have a very long lasting negative impact uh, on the united states around the world going forward i mean you you saw it right after you know end of empire uh, all, all of these, these sorts of things. So, look, I, Afghanistan was not Biden's failure. And I think you, anyone who sort of followed the, the course of that Afghan war would realize that, that Biden is one in a long line of presidents who, who did not uh, handle Afghanistan properly. But unfortunately, uh, his name will be associated with the, the botched uh, withdrawal. Yeah. That's why. What, what do you think? How do you how would you put this in context? Yeah, in terms of big picture, Biden administration had a few other alternatives. And then uh, Trump administration made a, a more, you know, a greater commitment for earlier withdrawal. And right. it, it, all issues about prioritizing, although the per, president's uh, own belief influenced this quick decision too. prioritizing wise, America was faced with a uh, real need to uh, geostrategic rebalancing to deal with the rise of China. And then also domestic issues are urgent as well. It reminds me of earlier historical cases like uh, during 1970s or early Cold War, when America really tried to shift the gear by prioritizing vital areas while sometimes abandoning peripheral areas as George Kennan has stated, right? So it is somewhat inevitable, uh, but the method and uh, the wise, to implement this withdrawal, there should be have been more pragmatic approach and realistic assessment, as Paul pointed out, uh, the capability of Afghan army. But when America also withdraw, it's rough. If you are in the receiving side, I remember that as I am historian of international history politics, and not to mention Vietnam. But when America America tried to withdraw out of Korea completely in 1970s, too, mm -hmm. then made South Korea to develop nuclear weapon. Then America slowed it down. Right? And uh, other earlier cases. So we should take all these things into uh, balance and the strategic restraint is uh, uh, inevitable required. In that sense, big picture wise, it is correct. There should have been more pragmatic approach yeah. to reduce the damage on American prestige and credibility. Yeah, and, and countries like China, which is not rising, it has risen. 
do, uh, how do they react uh, to this? Do they believe their own propaganda uh, that, uh, that America is uh, uh, unreliable, untrustworthy, and, and, uh, and a declining power? And, you know, people have done that before. It's extremely dangerous to underestimate that. I, know, I, would that on this, I would add on this point that uh, this kind of naked application of in terms of grand strategy, geopolitics, let Afghan be taken care of other powers or let internal uh, new kind of order emerge after America left. Let's wait. There will be bloodshed. Uh, and also America cannot take care of every uh, country around the world as was demonstrated in the case of non-intervention to Syria. It may be a lot of short-term complaint and critique, but in the longer term, new order emerge, and it can become China's opportunity or nightmare. Russia or China would come, America would stay away. In a sense, China has been benefiting the kind of stability in Afghanistan during the last 20 years, mm -hmm. while America was taking care of that. Right? This is a kind of naked, rather frank, uh, balance of power game. So that's what American strategies chose even during Clinton, uh, no, uh, tr uh, Trump era. That's what, why I said it's kind of grand strategy wise, there are a few other alternatives. Hmm. So America Johnson, could not drain its, uh, its resources there. Johnson, would you like to make a comment about this uh, issue? Yeah, I think that Biden inherited, uh, President Biden inherited a really, really bad situation. Uh, and if we're talking about what Dr. Scott had mentioned about state making and, and state building, I remember George W. Bush having said, basically, look, we did this in Japan, therefore we can do this in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's right. Which, which probably, if he had taken my class, he would know that's not something <laughs> <laughs> Because basically, what, what was the difference there? Well, in the case of Japan, you had Meiji, you had Taisho, and you had, uh, you had a population which demanded democracy, where in the case of Afghanistan, you didn't see that after 20 years. So yeah, from the... From, from, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Sorry, and, and, and Japan happened to surrender. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, All right, guys, so we're, we're fortunately we're running up against time here. This is so interesting to talk to you all. But uh, I want to address actually uh, what SY was hinting at and, and Paul as well. Uh, the domestic issues we've discussed and then the Afghanistan withdrawal uh, certainly took up a great deal of Biden's uh, focus and his energies and his administration. Um, but uh, is that at the expense of Asia? Uh, you, my sense is that uh, we, we have an ambassador now who's been nominated for Japan finally, and, and uh, we're not going to have time, unfortunately, to talk about that. But in the larger scheme of things, is, is Asia being overlooked? Now, is, uh, is Biden focusing properly on the economic hub of the world and addressing the risen China issue? No. Is he missing an opportunity here or missing an obligation, frankly? I, that, that's kind of the way I look at it. I don't think any U.S. president should not be thinking about Asia every day. But maybe I'm biased. Well, what do you guys think? I don't know that there's... I, I, a lot of evidence that he's ignoring Asia. I mean, I, I, I think that in recent months, and certainly since the beginning of his term, he's had of a lot of other things to, to, to worry about, either domestically or, or other places. Let's, you know, of course, Afghanistan is in Asia. <laughs> you know, that, that's an Asian uh, problem uh, as well. So I, I, I guess if we're talking about East Asia, if we're talking about Japan, if we're talking about China, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that he's necessarily ignoring uh, Asia. I don't, I don't see a lot of evidence of that. I think he has been rather dealing with the uh, East Asian security issues fairly well. Yeah. Uh, okay. The biggest challenge has been China's uh, more assertive neighbor operation and behavior in South China Sea, That's which right. threatened not just the United States, but all Asian neighbors too, uh, America's allies in East Asia. And to do that, uh, Biden administration has been marshalling up alliance support and cooperation with Japan fairly well bringing Japan to make commitment to the defense of Taiwan as well earlier this spring when Mr. Suga, Prime Minister Suga visited Washington DC. And South Korea, with South Korea as well, the alliance cooperation has been pretty well coordinated in dealing with the challenge posed by uh, ever assertive North Korea. And Taiwan is well embraced. And Australia is fully 
uh, uh, kind of you know, embraced by uh, American-led alliance. Although France, as Paul must have noticed, has been felt very alienated, deeply resentful. Uh, overall, Asia diplomacy and strategy-wise, Biden administration deserves some credit, in my view, compared with his predecessor. Greater credibility and predictability. <laughs> That's a low bar, S.Y., that you just uh, stated there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's the defense of Taiwan and uh, freedom of navigation in the seas in the South China Sea. Those are core issues. And I think that uh, submarine deal with Australia, you know, 16 nuclear submarines, not ballistic missile submarines, but um, uh, um, uh, they're not going to change the balance. But it certainly shows that um, that uh, the Biden administration and his head of uh, head of China policy, who wrote a book on the on uh, on uh, the blue water naval capability of China. Uh, this is all driven by, um, by uh, uh, Chinese um, um, expansion uh, at the maritime levels. And um, um, I think people are looking at that threat very, very real in Washington um, and around Asia. Um, okay. Very, very real threat of, of China um, militarily. All right. Well, it looks like you guys are giving him a passing grade uh, uh, just, on uh, his Asia uh, activities uh, administration. Maybe I, my my worries were uh, ill conceived. Johnson, do you have any last comment? We only have about a minute or so left. So, last comment goes to you, Johnson. I think in terms of the probability of war in Asia under Biden, it's actually gone down, and mm -hmm. part of that is I think more transparent diplomacy, although not perfect, obviously. Uh, and also increasing economic ties. I think those two things are going to make already a, a very low probability of war actually even less. So I think that is a positive uh, uh, trajectory. I agree. Okay. You all agree with that? <laughs> all right, guys. Well, I guess it's nice to end on a positive note there. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm pleased that you disagree with my, uh, my question here, that you actually see the Biden administration doing a competent job in, in Asia. Hopefully that will continue through the course of his administration. All right, well, that went by very quickly. Uh, again, thank you so much, all four of you, for participating. Uh, those of you that enjoy this program, uh, Think Tech is constantly looking for economic support, so please contact the Think Tech website, and you can contribute, mention this show, uh, and that'll be reflect positively on uh, this particular episode and uh, my series overall. I'll be back on air in a couple of weeks. I'm hoping to interview a former Consul General of the United States uh, to Japan. That's my plan at the moment. Thanks guys, really appreciate it. Thanks Paul for staying up late in Paris. I know it's late. You look very very awake, so <laughs> very bright. I appreciate it and thank you guys for waking up early in Japan. That's it. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>